Good morning, church. Good to see all of you, all smiling faces. I know particularly some of you are more happy than others, but I know one person who is very happy this morning. Yesterday, Dharma Raja beats Trinity, a historical win. And the coach of the Rajans is here, and he is very happy, I know for sure. I had the opportunity of seeing him the day before the match, and he was full of, he's very nervous, what's going to happen next day. Um, and I said, can I pray with you? And I prayed with him, and I said, to be honest, I'm biased on my prayer. <laughs> I said, you know, uh, because I finished by saying this, the result, Lord, let your will be done. <laughs> uh, but I'm really proud uh, because I know uh, he, uh, Achala started coaching Rajans uh, recently and it was his first match. Um, and, uh, you know, they had a historical win. So congratulations, Achala. Uh, this morning, as we come together, you remember that we started a series uh, four weeks ago. It's on missions and we have been coming on a journey. And if you remember the first week, the Pentecost week, we talked about uh, the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in the mission. And we talked about how Holy Spirit actually does three things. He actually shows our sins and He also shows our righteousness and He judges the world. Then the next week we talked about the role of the believer and we talked about the full story of the gospel. And if you remember, we talked about the creation, fall, redemption, and then new creation. And we, uh, and we saw how that God actually redeemed us for a purpose, and the purpose is to be on mission. And last week, as we uh, went from there, we were looking at uh, the whole uh, Great Commission, and we were talking about a movement, and we talked about how that we need to own the commission, and we have to realize that God has empowered us to fulfill this commission. And then we talked about also that the presence is made available for us to fulfill God's commission. As we come to the fourth week this morning, my title is that, uh, I'll ask somebody to put the, yeah, the cost of mission. And that's the title this morning, cost of mission, right? And last week as we saw in Matthew 28, Jesus said, go, all of you, you need to go. And in other words, he's calling us to be part of, uh, be in the ministry. Now, what is ministry? You know, most of us, we have this thing in our mind, when we hear the word ministry, we shut down because that's not for me. That is for some people who are called specially for a purpose. But I want to clear something with you this morning. What is ministry? Right? Let's look at what is ministry. Right? So what is Christian ministry is this. Christian ministry is taking your gifts and resources and using them to meet the needs of the people in Christ's name. Look at that definition. Christian ministry is taking your gifts and resources and using them to meet the needs of the people in Christ's names. Now, can you raise your hand if you have done some sort of a ministry according to this definition? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, many of you. Exactly. I, I realize that because it's not only few of us who are on the stage doing ministry, right? It is not those who are called into full-time ministry who is doing ministry. Every one of us, we do ministry because all of us have, have, have gifts God has given us and He has given us resources and we take the gifts and resources and we use it in the name of Jesus to bless someone. And when you do that, that's ministry. And you might be a new Christian, you might be new to this church, but if you are even giving, the Bible says, a cup of cold water to someone in the name of Jesus, that's ministry, Right? So we all, we all are part of what we God, God calls us to be, and that's we are in ministry. And I want you to clear that before we move on, right? But it is also very important to understand that there are principles govern the people who are called into ministry. Now, these principles are the same principle that governs the people who are called into what we call a full-time ministry like me, uh, and, and few other pastors here, and the same principle governs all people's life. The same principle governs all people's life. You know, but it's very important to understand that it governs all of us. You know why? It's because of 1 Peter 2.9. Let's read 1 Peter 2.9. What does it say? But you are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You got to understand, this is God is speaking to the church. God is speaking to every believer. And what does he say? He says, you are a chosen people. That's what he says. You are a chosen people. You are the royal priesthood and a holy nation. God's special possession. Why you have been told that? Look at what, what the reason is. That you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are supposed to declare. That's what you are supposed to do. You are supposed to say it out of what God has done for you. And we are all, underline that word, we are royal priesthood. In other words, you are part of priesthood. And if, if you have not realized this, I want you to know that this morning, all of us are called to be a priest. Right? And that's our role as Christians. And all of us are called into ministry. When you're called uh, uh, to Christ, you're called into ministry. What does that mean? I just want to share briefly some some of these principles that are not only governs the people who are called into what we call the full-time ministry, but all of our lives. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. As we are celebrating the Father's Day, I just wanted to say, Fathers, thank you so much for playing your role. And in this world, the greatest role that anybody can play is a father's role. And this world today is in a place, whether, it's, whether it be good or bad, it's because of fathers. And if you look at all the crimes that are committed today, uh, the people who are committing these crimes, if you go and talk to them, 90% of them are fatherless. Sometimes their father is not at home, or sometimes they have a father who is dysfunction, who is not playing his role, right? So fathers play a great role. And I, I know that some of you, uh, I know you fathers, I know I have spoken to you, I've, I've, I've dealt with you, and I'm really proud of you this morning. I want you to know because you work so hard and I know particularly in the last three years with the, with the you know, country situation, uh, you have played a huge role. And I just want to, with my, all my heart, I just want to say thank you for being that father and playing that role. Not just for your family, but like Pastor Johan was saying, even for others, right, as a spiritual father. So we're going to look at today, Father Abraham's life. He's the first person who got called out. He, we are from his uh, kind of uh, descendant. So we are going to look at his life and we are going to look at first four verses in chapter, uh, Genesis 12, verse 1 to 4. Let's read together. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we, Lord, going to draw out principles from this particular passage to understand how we have been called into ministry, I pray that you will open our eyes to see your truth. And Lord, not only that we will grasp the truth, but we will begin to live in the truth. Lord, to this extent, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Right? Okay. So, you will see the principles that, we'll, uh, that we'll, we will draw out from this passage, three principles particularly, are the principles that govern all the people who are in ministry, whether it be full-time or like people like you are, uh, who are living out there. The three principles, basically, we are going to look at this morning. Uh, the first one is, actually, when you meet God, He sends you out. That's the first one. When you meet God, He sends you out. The first thing we learn from this passage that we just read, or similar passages in the Bible, whenever you meet God, whenever you meet God, whenever you get a grip of who God is, it changes you into a person in mission. Whenever you get a grip of who God is, it changes you, a person, into mission. Anyone who meets God, uh, he, as he really sends you out, he sends you out, he pushes you out. Now, first thing that happens is, when God meets you, that you stop being a person of uh, self-centered. 
In other words, what he does in your life is that he actually, you know, destroy your consumer mentality, right? The word mission in Latin, it, it's missio, sent out. That's what it means, sent out. That means first thing he does is he sends you from yourself to out. And that's what he does. When you meet God, you have been living a life all this time self-centered. It's all about you. It's what you can get out of it and what is in for me. And from that mentality, the consumer mentality, what is in for me mentality is sending you out now to look at others, to look at the people around you, to look at the world. And that's exactly what God does when you meet him first to face first, right? So look at Abraham's situation. The first time God actually meets Abraham face to face. And look at verse 1, what does it say? Right? The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. So the first time when Abraham meets God face to face, he tells him to go. And that's what God does. When you meet him face to face, he will ask you to go. Now listen, you know, you might say, that's Abraham. He's a great man. He, he was asked to actually, he, God started a nation through him. Now, don't compare Abraham to me, pastor. I'm just another normal guy who's living on earth and I'm just struggling to even meet my, uh, meet my, uh, uh, meet, uh, my ends meet, okay, right? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not an Abraham. Don't compare. Yeah, you are right, but I want you to know you might be right, but I also wanted to say you are wrong because when God meets anybody, he sends them out. So I'm going to show you some examples of how God sends people out, right? If you look at Moses' life, Moses actually believed in God. Moses bowed down to God. Moses worshipped God. But you see in Exodus chapter 22, Moses had an face-to-face -face experience or meeting with God in the burning bush. And as he met God, what did God say? Go to Pharaoh. Now go to Pharaoh and, and you know, tell uh, him to send my people out from slavery. So God sent Abraham when he meets face-to-face, uh, -face, right? Uh, okay, Ab Abraham first, Moses Second, what a way to compare myself. Okay, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah meets God and he's completely blown out by seeing God. And he's on his, you know, he fe fe fell face down and he's saying, Lord, you're so holy. You know, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence and I'm not even, you know, ready to, you know, see you. But God says, Isaiah, listen to me. There's a group of people that I want you to go. These people will never listen to you. They're hard-hearted. For years and years, they are close their ears and hearts to me. And, and when you go and preach to them, they're not going to respond. They're going to be very hard. But I want someone to go. I don't know who is going to go. Isaiah gets up and says, Lord, send me. Pastor, you are still in the Old Testament. Jesus came. And tell, talk about Jesus' time. Talk about after Jesus. Yes, let me talk to you. Luke chapter 5, Peter. You know, he was a disciple of God. He was Jesus, he was walking with Jesus. And one day in Luke chapter 5, he goes to fish and then he comes back. He has caught nothing. And Jesus asked, what, did, what happened? I caught nothing. Jesus says, go back, Peter, and put your net on the other side. And Peter says, Jesus, I worked all night, and I'm a fisherman. I know this sea. There is no fish today. And it's only in the night that you catch fish. Jesus, you are not a fisherman. I know in the mornings you don't catch fish. But anyway, because you say, I'm going to go back and put the net. And he let the net out. What happened? He caught a fish that his boat began to sink. And then he came back. And what did he do when he came back to the ground? Do you remember? He fell on Jesus' feet and said, Lord, I'm sinful man. Don't even come close to you. Here, even though Peter has been dealing with Jesus over a period of time, this is the first time he's having uh, experience of seeing Jesus face to face. He sees the glory of Jesus. And he encounters Jesus. And as soon as he encountered Jesus, what did Jesus say? Peter... You're not anymore going to fish, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. Go out. Right? And then Paul, in the Damascus road, as he was going, he was a Saul, he was, he was actually persecuting the Christians, he was breaking the churches, he was doing all the damage to the churches. As he was walking on the Damascus uh, street, Jesus meets him and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? 
Paul is like, what? Am I persecuting you? Yes, when you persecute my church, you are persecuting me. And he had an encounter. Paul had an encounter with Jesus. And after the encounter, Jesus says, now I will make you an apostle to the Gentiles. Go! Church, do you see? Every time you see God face to face, he sends you out. Now, you know, these, all these people are history makers. They have changed histories. They're great men and women. And you might say, you know, I mean, I never had an experience like that. Let me tell you, I also didn't have an experience like that as a pastor. I remember living a self-centered life for a long period of time, even after becoming a Christian. It's all about me. It's all about how much I can earn. It's all about how I can improve my lifestyle. It's all about, you know, living for my next day's dream. But that was the day that God began to deal with me. And I had these encounters probably in the camps, probably at the services, in different places. As I begin to encounter him, God began to, you know, send me out of myself. And that was the beginning. And that, that journey ends up be being here as a pastor today. And he sends me out. And when I was in Colombo working in the church, and God spoke to me particularly, he said, go now, go out of Colombo. And it's because I heard his voice. I heard his instruction. I just said, Lord, I'm ready to go. He sends you out. And he sends you out. And that it has not stopped church. Even today in the church, he's sending out continuously. You know, it's a spiritual tornado. And if he comes and he catches you, he will change your life upside down. He will use you in a way that you can even imagine. He will never bless you except to make you a blessing. That's the principle. See, uh, he, he says, Abraham, I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing. God never, uh, but, but I want you to go. God never pulls you in without sending you out. Let me say that again. God never pulls you in without sending you out. God never blesses you except to make your blessing for someone else. That's how you know that you are dealing with a real God, not a religion. That's how you know that you are dealing with a real God, not a religion. Do you know that we are, we are sent by Jesus on mission? Let me show you. John 17 verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Jesus says to the Father, Lord, you sent me to the world. And that's why I came to the world, right? Jesus says, God, you sent me to the world. And, and Father sends Jesus to the world. That's why he came to the world. But he's saying, now, look at that. I have sent them into the world. Who is them? Who is them? Say next to, person next to you, it's you that Jesus is talking about. It's you. It's all of us. He sends all of us. He sends all of us into the world. You know, just before he said these words in, in about five verses before, he said another word, word thing that is very important to us. John 17 verse 13. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Can you see? He's talking. I'm telling these things, or I'm sending them so that they may have full measure of my joy within them. Do you experience the full measure of Jesus' joy in you? It's a good test. I don't want you to raise your hand, but it's a good test. Do you experience measure of joy, God's full joy in you? You know, nobody has joy like somebody who knows that you have got something that will change the world. Nobody has joy like somebody who knows that you have got something that will change the world, right? Nobody has joy until you finally serve something bigger than your interest, until you uh, serve something bigger than your career and work and your achievement, until you serve something bigger than your love life, until you be serve something bigger than your hurts and your pains and your brokenness. That's when you will have real joy, right? And your joy comes when you step out of yourself to serve this world. Jesus pours the joy that he has in you. Do you know nobody has a joy like Jesus Christ? You know why? Because there is no, there has never been a person in mission like Jesus Christ. 
No one has joy like Jesus Christ because there has never been a person like Jesus who has been in mission. The joy comes by being in the mission. That's where joy comes in. You know, I have no greater joy to see a life changing. You know, when I listen to a story of someone who has been, you know, living under slavery, comes to Jesus, and when I hear the story how that person's life has changed today, I'll tell you, even that the joy that I receive is more than 100 million rupees that I can get. That joy is something that cannot be replaced. It's something very special. And that joy is what God has given each one of you to experience by being in mission. And if you're not experiencing today, church, it's because we are still not, in, not on mission. That's my first point. If you really see God who he is, you lose your consumer mentality. You step saying, what is in for me? And you start saying, how can I spend myself? When you meet God, he sends you out. The second point is, when you meet God, he sends you out. Point number one, second point is, you cannot be a blessing to others unless you are willing to lose. Second principle from this passage, right? You cannot be a blessing to others unless you are willing to lose. You see, God says, Abraham, I am going to bless all the people of the earth through you, Abraham. I have a mission for you, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to, uh, you know, make you a blessing to others. Therefore, you need to get out. You need to pay a price. Get out of your familiar cult culture when, uh, where, where you are prominent and where you are comfortable. Get out of your homeland where everybody knows you. Get out of your safety zone. Go to a place that I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. Every step I will guide you. Take great risks. Make great moves. Get out. Pay a price. You cannot even be a public Christian without being, without paying a price. Am I right? You cannot even be a public Christian without paying a price, without getting out. Your family might get very upset the day that you announce that you're a Christian, finally. They're like, you know, did you change your religion? You're born to this religion, why did you change your religion? And, and they'll be very upset, very upset with you. And that is paying a price, Right? When you become a Christian, you might say, you know, uh, uh, when you become a Christian and, and all this time you are private about your faith, but, you know, now you're going to church and, and, and you, you know, people know you're going to church and, and some of you come in your vehicle and you park your vehicle and people pass us and they know that you are in this church. And then there is a lot of question, why are you going to this church? You know, I mean, very interesting. Vajra is the one who pointed out a couple of days ago. He said, you know, you can go to any, any Covils, any, any other worship place. Nobody will question about that. But when you go to church, people are going to question, why are you going to that church? Why are you going to that church? People have a problem. Are you now born again, Karaya? People have questions. And they're going to label you. You're going to name you. And you're going to lose your status, your, your you know, reputation in the, in the community as you become public about your faith. And this is paying a price. Church, you need to understand there is a price when you say you are a Christian. As soon as you, you know, start identifying yourself, as soon as you start just simply, you know, uh, uh, instead of being a private Christian to becoming a public Christian, that you go to pay a price. You know, in a moment we, we are going to pray for Pastor Roshan and his wife Irosha. They are going to move out of our church to start a church. Uh, in the Gurudenia area. From Gurudenia all the way to Rikilaka, Skada, uh, there is no uh, known uh, church in that area. So it's a long distance, right? And we want them to go and we want them to start a church, right? Because uh, our heart is to see this blessing that we have received going out to the, everybody in this city, everybody in this district, right? And, uh, you know, uh, there is nothing better than starting a church. You know why? Because there are so many hopeless people living in this world. And you know how you received uh, hope because Christ came into your life. And there's nothing greater than starting a church. And it's an exciting journey. It's, it's unbelievably exciting to start a new church. Right? 
but it also costs a lot. It also costs a lot. You know, uh, you have to get out your security. They have to go away from everything they are familiar, everything that is stable. They have to leave this big gathering, right, that we have been having every Sunday. They have to leave the big stage, the worship team, and all the backing and all the music that they hear every Sunday, right? And they have to leave a lot of friendships. They have to go on their own. They have to work hard to start a church. From scratch, you are starting something new. They need to put a lot of their time, energy, and resources to make this happen. You know, there is a cost when you're going out. But I don't think you cannot measure the cost to the blessing that, that's going to give when they go and do it. I'm going to call Pastor Roshan and Irosha to come up. And I want them to, this morning, we're going to pray for them. We're going to send them out. But before they, we pray for them, I want them to share their heart with you this morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, can you say good morning? <laughs> so it's nice to be here to talk to you guys. Uh, before I'm leaving, not, uh, I'm not leaving, but uh, at the moment, uh, we are going to plant a church in, uh, between uh, Gurudenia and Mailabitya. So first of all, I we would like to thank God for the grace and calling which he has given to uh, in Candy Main Church. But, uh, sorry, I'm not going to take uh, much time, right? So don't worry, I'm not going to preach like Pastor did. Uh, so cut short, uh, we are going to plant a new church between Gurudeni and Rikilagaskar area. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of a challenging thing. But, you know, our church vision is a church in every village. So we are taking it, we are admitting it, and we are accepting it. Uh, another thing is, main thing is, we understand that the church is all about missions, and mission is all about pray, give, and go. So we are going, so please pray for us, and stand with us. Amen. Amen. Will you give a good round of applause to Jesus? Okay, I'm going to call all the pastors to come up on stage and pray for them. And church, will you stand, your, stand to your feet and, and, and stretch your hands towards them as we pray and send them uh, to go on this journey. Pastors, uh, let's pray for them. Come. I'm going to ask two, two of you to come from the congregation to just come up and, and, and just lay your hands. Two people. Representing, it's not just the pastors. We are, as a church, we are sending together. So, quickly come. Two, two. Just walk up. Walk up. Quickly. Qu quickly, quickly, quickly come. No time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Let's stand with them and pray for them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Okay, let's, let's pray. Why, why don't you just, just open your mouth and just pray. Say a prayer for them. Just say a prayer as they go. Just bless them. Just bless them. Father, we pray for Pastor Roshan and Sister Hirosha. Lord, we bring them before you. We know, Lord, that you have already gone into those territories and you have started your work in them. Your spirit is already hovering in those places. We know this just wanted your people to hear and obey and they are here they are and they go forward Lord, trusting in you nothing of their gifts, nothing of their strengths, nothing. But they say I am available, we are available and as a family they take courage and walk forward and we thank you and praise you for that. We pray for your protection. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for Aaron too, Lord, that even as a child, even as he's joining the parents in this, that you will cover him with your precious blood. 
and Lord, even as they are going to know and experience new things, that all we know is your grace and mercy and your spirit will be with them and that you will carry them through and we as a church will cover them in prayer and that's the commitment we make, Lord, that we will mentor, walk, encourage and spur them on and that they are part of our family, Lord. Even though they may go forward, we know they are still part of us and we will continue to be that encouraging force for them. Lord, we release them into your hands and we know that your hand is protecting them and you will hold their hands and go forth with them into this area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for praying. You may be seated. You know, they have already moved out from their house in Bolavatta to a uh, house in Gurudenia. They have rented and they have moved out and they, are, so they have started their work last couple of months. They are putting uh, the groundwork uh, to, to continue to work on the uh, calling. So just keep them in prayer. Remember them. You have the brochure. You got it. And if you haven't got a brochure, you can ask and receive it today on your way out. You know what else you need to get out? You also need to get out of your wallet. Right? Because you suddenly realize with all these people going and new ministries starting, our, our budget goes up. And, and recently I was just looking at our budget, you know, with the new vision and the new plans, we need 100% more than what we are receiving right now. We are not making plans with the money that we have. And we will never do that. We plan and we envision with what God is showing us. And as God shows us, we take steps in faith. Right? And our expenses are going up for 100%. Last week, two couple of weeks ago, we started a full time training, Timothy and training after about, I think, 15 years in this church. We have started the training back again with three young people who have come in. Come in. And, and, and that will cost us about 100,000 a month just to, you know, to keep the training going. And all these are added new things. But, you know, we are not going to stop anything because we don't have money. Because we believe in a God who owns the world and he gives us. And so, you know, one of the ways that we, we can do this is by all of us joining together. It's, it's, it's like us. This is our church. This is our vision. So we also need to get out of our wallet. Uh, you need to dig deeper. You can't be a blessing to others unless you're willing to lose things. You can't uh, lose unless you're willing to give your money. You know, money is a good test to see whether you are really believing in God. And that's the way that we know when we give. You know, with all our, you know, as I was saying about our expenses going up, you know, one of the things that I want you to know is that as, as, as a pastor, as a church, we are not using this pulpit to, pulpit to preach about money and getting money. And you know that. If you are in this church for a long period of time, you know about that. But if you are visiting us, you are new in this church, I want you to know that, right? And, and what I'm going to say right now, if you are not part of this family, if you don't consider this is your church, doesn't, it doesn't you know, actually applies to you. But if you think this is your family, this is your family, then it applies to you. You know, and I want to lay some principles before you give. You know, because there are so much things out there about giving and I want to correct what, where we stand. You know, the first thing is you don't give out of fear. You give out of love. Right? A lot of preaching out there is to put fear in you to, to, to give. But I want to know there is no difference if you're giving in fear, you're giving to a katadi and giving to God. We, our God is a not, a, not a God who put fear to get money. That's not the case. God is absolutely clear. He is, is a loving God and He will never put fear in your life to receive money from you. So, don't give out of fear. Number one. Number two, the principle is that don't give expecting a double blessing in that sense. Expecting a double blessing of money. We have a lot of preaching out there. If you give to this particular ministry, God will bless you twice. If in terms of money, that's what their teaching is. And I want you to know that that's not the teaching this church agrees with. And we don't believe in that teaching. Right? So don't ever give expecting to double your money. For that, you might have to try casino. <laughs> not God. Our God is not that. He is not just this person who is, you know, there, uh, who is trying to play with you. Right? And he is, he is, he is, he is a God who gives. And John 3.16 says that God gave, God so loved the world that he gave. 
God so loved the world he gave. What did he give? His only begotten son. Why? So that you will not perish, but will have eternal life. So God has given ultimate thing to you. So do you think that he's going to, because you give money, he's going to twice your money and give back to you? I mean, come on. He's not such a small God. Don't make him so small. He's not so small. He has given you everything. He has given his son. There's nothing more he can give. Right? So that's very important. But the word, word of God says in Psalm 34 verse 8, test and see that I'm really God. So in that sense, there is a faith journey. That faith journey is that, you know, your money is, is something that you hold on to. You are, you are fearing that if I give this out, I will not have enough to live or my, I won't be able to live a comfortable life. So God says, test me. The testing is that you give out. So it's not that you're expecting double, but you are, you're, in that sense, God is saying, I will take care of you. I will take care of you. I'll take care of your needs. Don't worry about that. I will take care of you. I will take you through. How many of you survived the COVID and the economic crisis? Show your hands. All of you. I mean, you did it because he provided. Didn't he? He provided. Right? I mean, you, you didn't have your salary. Your salary was cut down. You didn't have that. You didn't have this. You had so much shortcoming. But God took care of you. He took you through in this journey. He never made you to become a pauper or to get out, of the, uh, out to the street and beg. No, he didn't able to do that. He provided for you. Right? So, these are very important, right? So, how do we give in AGK, Assemblies of God Candy? The first is, we believe we give our tithes to God. Tithes is 10% of our income. That we get, we give to God. Now, you know, if you're someone who is giving your tithes, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I just want to encourage you to give it monthly because, you know, we run the church with what you give. The second thing I want to tell you is that if you have still not started giving your tithes, you know, it might be big to go to the 10% jump. Some of you are like, you know, I'm new and 10% is big for me. Uh, because that's because you have still not have come to, you haven't had that encounter, the meeting with God, right? When you have the meeting with God, this is not big for you, right? It's okay, wherever you are. So start with whatever the percentage you can, right? Right? And then and, and start increasing. So the 10% ties is what we give a monthly basis. But we also give what we call the missions pledge. You have a card with you. And if you don't have a card, just raise your hand. Somebody will give you very quickly. All of you, if you have a card, if you don't have a card, anybody? So that this card is about missions. Missions is what we talked about. We are sending people out. It's all about, you know, uh, people out there, not this church, not to take care of this church. This money will not be used to take care of this church. This money will be used for the people who have gone out of this church. Those who are in the villages, those who are in the different places, this money is solely used for them. Their expenses, we are taking houses on rent for them. We are are taking halls to meet uh, as churches. We have to take care of them. We need to give them a... So this money is for that, right? And we are using for that. And you know, when you give, you are gi that money will be used completely for this purpose. So that's Vision Pledge is all about, right? So uh, when, I, when you are giving the Mission Pledge, I want you to understand one thing, right? You don't give out of what you have, right? It's easy to give what you have. But I want you to give sacrificially. I want you to stop doing something that you're normally doing and give that. It has to cost us because we are talking about the mission, the cost of mission. And when you're giving to mission, it should cost us something. We, it, it might alter our lifestyle. It's okay because we are doing this because we are going to be part of what God is doing outside. So it's, it'll cost you. But I want you to you know, feel that way when you're doing it. But definitely, I'm not going to put guilt on your heart. I'm not going to say, if you don't give, this will happen to you, that will happen to you. But I want you to give out of love. If Jesus, if God loves you so much to give his son, you know, how do we reciprocate that love? It's, it's by giving. And give because you love Jesus. That's the way I want you to give. But don't write still, because my message is not completed yet. I want to make a one more point before I, I, I actually... Uh, get to uh, ask you to give, right? Um, you know, when you give, you're not only obeying God, but you're becoming like God. When you give, you're not only obeying God, but you're becoming like God, because God is a God who gives, right? 
and and it's a characteristic of god when you begin to give uh, back to god okay so okay lastly uh, but here is the good news i have a good news for you right last point is a good news for you the first point is when you meet god he sends you out first principle second principle is you cannot be a blessing to others unless you are willing to lose the last principle out of that uh, genesis chapter 12 verse 1 to 4 is when god sends you out you will lose things but god will bless you god said to uh, abraham i will bless you now what is this blessing that god is talking about it's not just financial material blessing god is talking way beyond financial and material blessing god particularly promises when people are willing to go out and be the christian in their work when people are willing to go out into mission when people are willing to put their lives on the line when people are willing to put their time on the line when people are willing to put their money on the line god says i will bless you take take a look when was it that jesus christ got a great shower of the holy spirit when did he get it you remember matthew 3:17 right do you remember jesus how did the dove came upon jesus you remember that when was that huh baptism jesus is baptism when was he baptized just before he started his earthly ministry right just before he started his earthly ministry the holy spirit came upon jesus and there was a voice from heaven saying this is my son whom i love and well pleased right and this is the blessing of giving when you start taking a step to go out and be in mission god blesses you greatly with his presence his love he showers the holy spirit upon you when you decide to take a step for him to get out there right how do you know you're a child of god how do you know you're a child of god you can know by this you can know by this you have accepted christ as your personal savior and you are coming to church you are believing in him and you are seeing a change in your life over a period of time you are becoming like christ and it's a logical conclusion seeing all that to say that you are a child of god you are absolutely right but there's another way of knowing how, uh, that you are a child of god the bible talks about the holy spirit comes and with our spirit it actually speaks to us and confirms that we are a child of god that's another level of confirmation and in that level of confirmation god speaks and says this is my son this is my daughter whom i love and well pleased and that's another level of god's love pouring out upon your life and that kind of love comes upon you only when you start going out only when you take great risk for god only when you put your life on line you will see god doing that church i want you to know in my spiritual life i'm 30 years being a christian in my spiritual life do you know what is the greatest time or the most blessed time in my spiritual life do you know which period it's the last two and a half years when i'm in kandy after i stepped out of colombo to come to kandy was the greatest spiritual blessing i received from god i am getting every day new revelations of who god is i've never preached the way i'm preaching in kandy i'm seeing the scriptures the way i've never seen before my spirit all the time is longing for god in colombo in the morning i pray then i forget about god because so much you are running and running and running but in kandy when i get into my bike to come to church in the in the in that short period of time god speaks to my heart he confirms that he's you're my son and i'm well pleased with you god actually puts a new thought in my mind all these sermons god is putting in in my heart because he is like working very closely and i'm experiencing a greater blessing in kandy you know why because we decided to leave colombo to come to kandy when god said go that's it that's it it's a greater blessing and this is the blessing god is talking about he's not talking about financial and just material yes we don't starve as a family we are living a very good life our children go to good schools god provides we are not in debts we don't think about finances we hardly pray about our finances to be honest god provides all our needs that's the truth i would i will let you know that we are not in need i want you to know that as your pastors 
God has blessed us. But you know what? It's more than that. It's that spiritual blessing. It's that, you know, walk with Jesus every day. It's that sweet presence. It's the joy that he puts in our heart. No matter how tiring. Sometimes my wife keeps saying, you're working too hard, you're working too much. It's true. You know, she's concerned about me. But I want you to know, you know, in Colombo, when, when I work hard, I, I feel a burnout. But in Candy, it's not the case because I'm constantly renewed and revived by God. I'm walking with him. I feel like he's walking with me. He's with me all the time. And that's the difference. And that happens because when you step out for him, when you step out for him, church, that's the blessing God is talking about. He wants to give you that blessing. And are you ready to step out? Step out, your, out of your comfort zone. Step out of your, you know, uh, known territory to be a public Christian, to be on mission, to, to even, even to sacrifice some of your weekends and times to go out and see what's happening in our church ministries elsewhere. You know, if you want to do that, let me know. I'll arrange for you to go out on a Sunday or a Saturday. Just go out and see what God is doing in other places. Just go witness. I want you to do that. And, and, and as you do that, as you do these things, God will bless you more. God will bless you. But His blessing is more than money. I mean, definitely He's going to bless you, like I said. But more than that, it's about, you know, His presence pouring into your heart. His love pouring into your heart. And you will be, almost you'll be saying, Lord, that's enough, Lord. I'm, I'm so showered by your love. That's enough, Lord. And that's the kind of outpouring is waiting for you when you step out in Him. Now I want you to take that card into your hands. And you see the card has two portions. Right? I've already had into two. Right? So the first part is the big part. Big part basically asks you to fill your name. And uh, it says your telephone number, your email address, and then where you live, your area you live. And then there is a place called uh, amount. That amount is basically monthly what you are going to give for missions. Remember, this is not tithes, this is mission. Whatever the amount, one amount, just one amount monthly for 12 months. For next 12 months, each month, you don't put the full amount for 12 months. Just put monthly what you're going to give. Monthly, it's about 100 rupees, 500 rupees, 5,000 rupees, whatever the amount, right? Monthly, how much you're going to give. That monthly amount, put it down, right? And then you have the blue part. Blue part also has the amount. There, you write down to remember for you how much you committed. Then you can tear the card into two, right? The detailed card, give it back to a pastor. The small card, the blue card, you can have it with you in your Bible so that you remember the commitment you made for next 12 months. You're making this commitment to give it to church. Now, remember this also, I want to tell you. Because you have filled your details, we will never call you and ask, hey, sister, brother, you haven't given this month your mission pledge that you committed. No, we won't do that. Okay? I want to assure you that. We will never do that. Right? That's not our part. This is between you and God. You're giving. You say, you give, you give. If you don't give, that's, you know, fine with us. That's not the case. We will never call. If somebody calls, let me know, right? Uh, we will never call, okay? So I want to give you that assurance as well, right? But this money will be used 100% solely for the missions out there, not for this church expenses. This is going out for people who are out there in the villages, out there in the uh, different places who are working and doing ministry. Yeah?